I got to give a shout out to to Jackie McBride for this this hookup for this interview. You know, Jackie was on my podcast a couple weeks back. Um, she's just incredible, such an amazing human being. She shared about her Hall of Fame career at BYU, and then from that, she offered to connect me with our guest today, who is a former NBA Finals champion, two time with the Boston Celtics. He also played basketball at BYU. But he has a, a very long career in the NBA, and he has a lot of insight as to what it takes to compete at that level. We were going to be talking about a lot of stories here. So shout out to Jackie for connecting me with our guest today. It's amazing. Greg Kite is going to be joining us. Awesome stories coming your way. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the players he played alongside. Just, just to give you a little bit of perspective. I mean, we're talking about Danny Ainge, Kevin McHale, uh, Bill Walton. We're talking Larry Bird. We're talking... Uh, he was with the Magic when Shaquille O'Neal came to the team. He played alongside Reggie Miller, played alongside Patrick Ewing. I mean, he's been a, he's been around some of the best players in the NBA, some of the biggest names, and he's learned a ton. And uh, he himself is an amazing athlete. So we're going to learn a lot about what it takes to compete at that level and the life lessons that he learned along the way. So please stay tuned. This is the Game Time Guru. So what time is it? Game Time Guru. This is the Game Time Guru podcast, where I interview sports figures from all over the world to help deliver a panoramic view on sports. So whether you're a former athlete, one of the crazies, or simply a casual sports fan, this is the perfect show for you as we peel back the curtains and learn from our guests every single week. I'm your host, Shane Larson, and I'm helping you see sports through a different lens. What's up, everyone? Welcome out to another episode of the Game Time Guru Podcast. Shane Larson here, host of the show. Excited to have you guys on board with us for yet another interview. We're in the middle of June. Um, almost, dude, this is crazy. Almost through June at this point. We're closer to the end of June than we are in the middle of June. It's just weird to me. Um, and summer's going by pretty quick. But what that means, the show has been going on for seven and a half years. And it is con continuing to grow. And that's what I just wanted to say. You know, Thank you to everybody who's tuned in. I, I know that those who have listened for a while hear me say this quite frequently, but it does take an entire village. So for every guest that's joined the show, for everybody who's listened, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, welcome aboard. I hope that you would hit that subscribe button and listen to any other interviews that we've done or that we will do in the future. If you guys don't know the, the format, we launch a new episode every Friday and uh, we get to hear from our guests and learn from them. That's that's the whole point is providing a platform to learn from the people who have been there. Um, so this is what we're doing. I just appreciate everybody tuning in. Joining us today, as you guys heard in the introduction, very special guest. It was a connection of mine um, through Jackie McBride, Hall of Fame basketball player at BYU, as you guys heard a couple weeks back. She joined the podcast, shared an amazing story. Um, and now we get to hear from a friend of hers, which I'm super grateful for. Uh, man, a man of many, I guess we could say many titles, many accolades, former NBA player, former NBA champion, timely interview, considering the Celtics just won a championship this week that we're recording this. Um Crazy uh, former BYU basketball. I mean, he, we we've got it all here. We'll learn more about his story. His name's Greg Kite. Greg, thanks for joining the show, man. Great to be with you, Shane. Uh, yeah. Excited to be here and uh, fired up to let's talk some basketball and whatever. Let's 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 chat it up, man. So it's funny because I I believe uh, so a, a guy that I go to church with his name's David Tidwell and he actually played football back in the day at. Uh, he knew who you were basically because he's like, yeah, because he played in the days with like Steve Young. He played one year with Steve and stuff over in, in, in Provo. And he knew who Jackie was and his wife knew who you guys were too. Like, so uh, anyway, I go to church with him and he's like, oh yeah, Greg Kite. Yeah. Like, you know, we know, so David, we know David and the Tidwells very well. And in fact, uh, and David's brother, Niels Tidwell, his wife, Gina, live up there. He played on the football team and we often, we go on vacations with him usually every year or so. Still in touch, and we were all uh, the Tidwell, Niels Tidwell, his wife, and Jackie, and her husband Brent, and my, my me and my wife Jenny. We lived all in the same stairwell and married student housing at uh, at uh, BYU our last uh, couple of years there. So, uh, real tight bond with with all those couples, and great to know that you know Dave and his family. Wonderful people. Oh yeah, they're some of my favorite human beings. Yeah, I've I've gotten to know him the last couple of years, serving alongside him, and. Just uh, a really cool opportunity. So, yeah, I just thought it was so funny. The, he, first, I told him about Jackie when I was interviewing Jackie. And he's like, oh, I know Jackie. That's crazy. And then he was telling me the story. And then when I told him just last week who I was going to be interviewing, he's like, dude, I, that, the same the same way I know Jackie, I know Greg. He's like telling me the whole thing. I'm like, wow, what a small world this is, right? It, it gets smaller by the day. It's crazy. So, 
you know, Greg, I want to I want to rewind the clock a little bit. I know people probably are starting to Google your name by the time they listen to this interview. They're going to be like, oh, dude, Greg, okay, NBA champion. They want to know. OK, let's rewind the clock a little bit, though. I want to uh, I want to even go before the college days. And I just want to kind of learn about your background in, in athletics, because, you know, if some look you up, you're a tall guy, tall in stature. They might think that, like, you know, maybe basketball was just always in your DNA. I don't know. This is where I want to unpack it, like your athletic career. So at what point, like, did you get into sports? Did you have siblings that were into athletics, you know, a, a father, mother that were into athletics? Like, when did you get into athletics and what sports did you compete in at a young age? I first played competitive sports with Little League Baseball and Little League Football. I was uh, eight years old, seven, eight years old in uh, Houston, Texas, where I grew up. And I was the youngest of four kids, my older brother, two sisters, and my, my brother, Chris, five years older. He was very involved in in sports and so some of the sports were just in the neighborhood in those days you know we went outside and played that's what we did so if we weren't playing hide and go seek or catching frogs or tag we were playing be basketball baseball football in the street or down at the park and uh so i would tag along with chris you know i'd get uh, first when they're playing basketball on the driveway on the outdoor hoop I, I got to be the scorekeeper and then maybe the referee and then finally as get a little older they let me play but uh uh, you know, I watched him and uh, other neighborhood kids play Little League baseball. So that was uh, really the first thing I got into. And uh, but I love uh, uh, I was involved through through those years and through my uh, school years in up to a certain point with football, baseball, track and uh, and basketball. So this is a good question. And I guess I'll piggyback off what you just said there. Uh, multi, multi-sport athlete. And, and you know, what's interesting, Greg is like today in 2024, I coach club basketball, uh, myself. So I coach the high school kids that are in, in the AAU part of basketball. And what I've noticed a lot of is that they start to really hone in on one sport as they get the younger and younger that they're not that like, they're starting to just focus on one because it seems like sports are all year round. And there's, it's kind of frustrating because I'm kind of part of that with the AAU scene. They have to play basketball in the spring and then the summer and, you know, I feel like back in the day, it just seemed like more and more people like were competing in multiple sports. And as a multi-sport athlete yourself, did you feel like that benefited you? And what do you feel about like the era today, like where we're at today in regards to like athletes not really playing multiple sports as often or as many sports, I should say? Well, there's there's definitely some good cross training from going to other sports. And it's all I think all the kids and, you know, college and pro players do this especially pros, you need some time off. So some of what we do and somehow we cycle with our, our youth sports now is it doesn't give the kids that. And we, I, I think it, it would be a good idea. Even if they're just playing one sport, you need three or four weeks off where you're just not doing that and get away from it. But um, the, uh, you know, but even for me, I did get specialized a little bit and I'm six eleven or used to be, maybe I'm shrinking at my age a little bit, but I was, 610 by the time I was in ninth grade and uh, one of the sports I loved was playing playing baseball I wasn't playing on the high school team but the senior league kind of like pony league 15 years old and I'm playing in the uh, uh, all-star game and I, I, I had a big strike zone I was a pretty decent hitter guy struck me out three times and I realized <laughs> that wasn't the ticket now the saving grace was that guy went on to pitch at Texas A&M so he was a pretty good pitcher but I didn't play baseball after that. And then uh, after ninth grade, I didn't play football either. Not so much because I didn't want to do it. And and, and back then, you know, like our, my basketball coach was the, the offensive and defensive line coach for the, for the varsity football team at Madison High, where I went. But the seasons when we got in high school, they overlapped in Texas. In other words, our basketball practice would start October 15th and uh, we'd start games November 15th and the football team would be playing until – at least Thanksgiving, and then he got in the playoffs or played in December. So that's kind of where I made the decision to stop those other sports. But, yeah, you know, the, the question about how does it affect kids and is the best thing these days, eh, there's pros and cons. Yeah, for sure. No, that's interesting. Um, and it's, I guess everybody has their story, right, of when, like, their, uh, their moment, their aha moment or their realization of, okay, maybe this isn't, Maybe this isn't for me, but like I can still do something else. Uh, here's just the baseball strikeout story. I think yeah. every one of us that's competed at some point kind of has that moment. But, um, you know, I had it myself and I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'm not going to be going on to college for this one. So anyway, um, as a as a as a tall 
relatively speaking, but I would say most people would consider you a taller individual. Did you always have a feeling like in the sport of basketball that you were going to go to the next level? Like at least when you were in high school, did you say, Hey, like I'm going to, did you have college coaches looking at you and saying, Hey, like you got this. Um, or did you have to like work at it? It was like, what did you feel like you, as far as your recruitment and the spotlight on you? Because there's not a lot of kids in high school, especially that age that are six ten, six eleven, um, and highly athletic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it goes back to when I was 10 years old. As a 10 year old, I, I kind of, even though I was playing these other sports, I fell in love with basketball. That's when I put on my first organized team at a YMCA. Then the following year, I was playing what we called junior high back then, but middle, middle school in most places. And I was growing a lot. So, but even from that, as a 10 year old, I knew that I wanted to play high school basketball like my older brother was playing. playing. Uh, they also got to play in one of the last all church basketball tournaments or his church, our church team out there in Salt Lake City or went out to Salt Lake. So that was pretty, pretty cool. And uh, so play high school like him. And then we became fans of uh, college basketball. University of Houston had some great teams back then with Alvin Hayes and Don Chaney and even the NBA, like the Houston Rockets came to move from San Diego to Houston about, about that age, about when I was about nine, 10 years old. So uh, that's what I dreamed about, wanted to do, wanted to be from that. That, that age on from, from, from 10 on. And so I kind of had these, you know, these goals, I knew it wouldn't uh, just happen. I was just wanted to do that. And like I said, you know, 10, 11, 12, I'm 13. I'm growing a lot, you know, a little uncoordinated. So I had some great coaches, uh, you know, even going back to the first coach of that uh, YMCA 10 and under team, but I had excellent coaches, uh, you know, in high school, junior high college. And so, you know, I learned a lot of things, did a lot of drills, put a lot of hard work into it. And uh, that's what you know helped to get me to each ensuing level. No, that's so cool, man. So let's let's talk about this, Greg. Like as you get to the next level, as you know, you get on onto the collegiate level. What was the transition out of high school like for you? What were those next couple of years like, going from high school to the next phase of your life, mm -hmm. um, so to speak? Well, um, you know, going back, being in a big city like Houston, I got to play a lot especially in the summers and the fall before uh, the before the high school basketball season or high school basketball practice started with college players and even pro players when I'm like in 10th, 11th, 12th grade. So, and then I was, uh, you know, uh, among uh, one of the best players in the country. I was at McDonald's High School All-American. So I got to go to some camps before my senior year in high school and then to all-star games after my senior year with some top players that, you know, went on to be very good good college players. So it wasn't like it was a surprise going to play with college players, but, you know, I got to BYU in 1979, 1980. That might've been the most talented, best team that we had. We didn't go as far as we did the next year in 81, but uh, here I was a freshman, you know, high school All-American and I was a backup coming off the bench. We had a senior center, Alan Taylor, who was a very good, good center, all conference, went on to play a little bit of pro ball and, uh, so I, I, I sat a little bit. So different time, different era, you know, a little bit. You, you grow and you learn and uh, and you have a little patience. And, it, it you know, it, it worked its way out and I had three great years after that at BYU and then went on to the NBA. But that transition, I would say, actually say, you know, the transition, even though I played against pros in college and even going back to high school, the transition from – college to the NBA was bigger than from high school to the to college. Ooh, and, and some of that's just the length of the season, and, but also the, the the overall caliber and size of the, the length and size of the people you're playing with and against. Ah, two things I want to touch base on too, but I do want to ask you that because like you as one of the top players in the country, like you were well known, you were a McDonald's All-American, like you, you were, so I, I try to tell this to my athletes, Greg is like, listen, I love you all, but we're from Idaho. Most of you guys are under six foot three, six two. Like you're young, you're smaller guards, and you think you're gonna go play the next level and just get minutes and be like the score. And I'm like, you gotta understand, like the game is not. There's gonna be people there that are better than you. Period. Point blank. And so, like for someone like yourself, who you just mentioned, one of the top players, you know, come into college and even yourself, because of the situation at hand, you had to be a backup for that first year and kind of learn the ropes, right? As you had some other players that were there that 
were were ready for the game and they were already in the system and they were doing the thing. What advice would you give to young athletes that, you know, go to the next level? Cause they don't, I don't think anybody really understands. They might be like their best player on their team in high school or one of them, but when they get to the next level, even nowadays I've seen at the junior college level, it's so much more talented because transfer portals are pushing people back to the junior college level. So you've got junior college kids that are like 20 years old and they still have a year or two of eligibility because they're coming out of the transfer portal. And it's like these high school kids, 17, 18 years old, they're just not developed like that. And so they get really impatient. They're like, Oh my gosh, I don't, I didn't realize that they don't need me to score. Well, what else can I do? So I'm just curious what advice you would give players having been in that situation yourself where you had to be patient and trust the process and still put in the work so you could develop. What, what advice would you give to the kids coming out of high school, going to college? Well, I think number one, you got to be kind of dual folk or dual mindset here. One, you got to think you can make it there. You got to be positive you know, I'm going to be the best I can be and believe in yourself. You got to have that confidence to do it, but also you have to be realistic and know that, you know, it just doesn't happen for everybody. I think mean, you need to take care of things in the classroom, need to develop some other interests because, you know, at some point being able to play competitive basketball, whether it's high school, college, or pros, it ends. And it ends when you're pretty young, you know, in your late teens to in your 20s, maybe in your 30s. And it's a and it's a uh, very narrow funnel that take people up to that next level. So you look at, you know, how many high school boys and girls do we have playing in, in the U.S.? I don't know, a half million, million, and overseas, internationally, a lot of, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds playing college basketball. What maybe 10,000 players playing at all the different levels from JUCO on up. But in pro basketball, I was just working at the uh, as a mentor. You have some retired players there and current players as coaches uh, at the uh, NBPA, the National Basketball Players Association, top 100 camp in, in Orlando last week. And it's uh, where they have basically the top 100 high school kids there. And most of these kids will be major college players, but they gave them some stats. So, so for example, those numbers that funnel, in 75 years in the NBA, there's been 4,800 players who played. And the number goes way down to players who played over five years. It goes down... Uh, they played over 10 years to uh, over 900. I'm part of that group. I played 12 years. So I'm one of 950 people or something in 75 years to play that. 15 years, it goes to like 160 or something. 20 years, there's only 11 players who played more than 20 years in the NBA, with 22 being the, the longest, Vince Carter. So I, I guess the moral to that story is, you know, whether you're going to – you're going from high school to college or even a high school team, I always I – always, teach or talk about this at camps or when I, I help out with some high school kids in Orlando at the school that we operate is that, you know, there's a lot more to the game of basketball. And I'm sure the same could be is true of a lot of other sports. You know, you got 10 players out there, you got one ball. So if the ball was shared equally, you got the ball 10% of the time. Right. But it's not shared equally as we all know. So what do you do that half of the game when you're playing defense, what do you do that, you know, other 40, 50, 40 percent plus of the time when you when you don't have the ball to make your team better. And what do you do with your mindset, and your attitude, and your preparation? If you're OK, I have a starter here, you know, and I was, I was a big scorer in high school. Now I'm coming off the bench, <laughs> you know, so uh, that's, you know, besides the, the size and the skill, that's a, that's a big part. Part of it is what do you do with the rest of your game? So, you know, we work and you work on skills, you got to be like in basketball, you want to be as efficient as you can, you know, and as good a score as you can. But, you know, if you're a great shooter, maybe scorer like Steve Kerr or Judd Bushler or uh, going back to old school here, or um, B.J. Armstrong, uh, John Paxson, you go to Chicago Bulls and you're not the main scorer, you know. You're, you, you know, you, you're, you got to be really good with those shots and opportunities you get, but you're – you're out there on the floor because you can play defense, you can handle the ball, you can pass the ball, you can set picks, you can make the hustle plays. And so, you know, as far as basketball, that's huge. Man, that's a, it's a really good, the way you just said that, I, I want people to rewind that and like listen to exactly what you said. If there was 10 players on the court, you know, and even if you got the ball equally, if it's, just, it's like 10% of the time, what are you doing the rest of the time to make an impact? Like just that, that thought, when you break it down statistically, just, for people to understand that it makes more sense. And I think it's like a re reality check. It's like, ah, oh yeah. 
So I appreciate you sharing that. That's huge. Um, now, Greg, you mentioned when you went to the NBA, like or went to the prof like the professional level was a harder transition than going from high school to the collegiate level. And you mentioned a couple of things. And one thing you even mentioned like length and just size overall. One thing that I noticed, and this is what was crazy, is I went to when LeBron James was a, a rookie. We went to a Utah Jazz game when he came in, and I remember we were sitting close to the court for that particular that game. And I remember just like seeing LeBron out there and he had his wingspan and I was looking at some of the other players, even on an NBA court, it felt like the court was small. And I was like, just seeing it from a different angle. Usually I'm up at the top seats. Cause I don't have the money to go down the low seats, but we were down below. And I'm like, Holy cow, dude. Like these guys are big boys. Like they, the, the court shrinks and with the spacing and the speed that they play at, it looks like a small court, even though it's a, it's the biggest court you can play on. Like in the, in, you know, from talking about like any level of basketball, it looks small. And so I have always like talked about that. Just like the, like the length of high level athletes in the sport of basketball is just so crazy. Their, their size is just wild and how they're able to space that on the floor. And somehow we have a bunch of dudes that are under six foot three, six foot four in Idaho. And we can't figure out spacing. It's just insane to me. But like, I'm curious when you get into the NBA or when you get into the professional level, what was the biggest reality check? Was it like, did you feel like you were strong enough? Did you feel like you were skilled enough? Or did you feel like, man, like we've got a lot to work on? Yeah, I, I, I was strong enough and I got stronger and matured a little bit more, but I, that was a, one of the better assets I had. You know, whereas sometimes guys come in to the NBA or college and they need to fill out, gain some strength. That's right. just part of it. And that's like LeBron. LeBron came into the NBA 20 years ago, built like an NFL linebacker or tight end. So he, he's had a, you know, a pro body right from the start, but, um, but length, what you mentioned, that's a huge thing. Not that we didn't see players with that, but, you know, we always talk about how tall a basketball player is, but we don't do anything with the top of our head, our head in the game. It's not soccer. So it's all about how long you are. So my reach and also, you know, hands can help with that. My I'm six eleven, but my reach is about seven feet and I can reach up standing reach about eight eleven. So Kevin McHale played with us with the Celtics. My height are maybe a little bit shorter. He could reach up about five inches higher than I could. Robert Parrish, seven feet, he could reach a lot higher than I could. Bill Walton, when he came over six, you know, again, and even other positions, Dennis Johnson, back then a six five guard, very long arms. So, and that's what that's what the pros in college you know look for often. They say, okay, this guy's a six three guard, but he's got a six eight reach, you know, or he's a six eight. You know, um, a great example, BYU's got uh, Fus Traore, uh, post guy's about 6'6", six, six, and, and built like Wayman Tisdale or somebody like that, and, and great in the post, but he's probably got a, he's got a reach that's about seven feet. So, you know, your arms don't get any shorter when you get tired. So <laughs> you might not jump as quick or as high. So being able to get the ball, uh, you know, being able to defend, being able to get a shot off, being able to get the balls, rebounds, whatever, with – with reach is a big thing. And then, you know, and then of course, you know, lateral, lateral movement, lateral quickness, those kind of things. So that's, you know, when you get to the NBA, like I said, I went to the Celtics and it was, there were four Hall, future Hall of Famers on the team there then, and they were all big, long, long guys. And, and uh, even other guys who weren't Hall of Famers, you know, Cedric Max. So that was a big differentiator there. And, and then just the, the skill level, the skill level, the guys I was playing with and against was, you know, the tops in the game. So it takes some time to adjust. Plus the NBA season, you know, you're going from college, high school, 30, 35 games, maybe at the most. And you're going to the NBA exhibition games of eight back then, uh, six now, 82 regular season games. And if you're a team that goes deep in the playoffs, like the Celtics just did, and we did, you know, that's 20 plus games in the playoffs. So you're playing, a, you know, well over a hundred games, uh, with a playoff team and it's just a it's a long season so it takes a, that's an adjustment for a rookie or first or second year player man i bet and and, and that's one of the things like so a couple of, like the the celtics themselves i mean obviously historically one of the most like talented franchises right they're just they do things the right way from what it sounds like and you know talking to a lot of different you know former basketball players current basketball players that play in the nba I've heard some things, just every franchise is different. Like not everybody's ran the same. It's almost like a different business for everywhere you go. Everyone thinks like the general fan would probably just think they're all ran the same way. They're just in a different city, but they're not. It's like a different business everywhere you go. Sometimes you get players in there that are just collecting a paycheck. And sometimes you get players that want to win. 
you were over there with, what, like you said, future Hall of Famers that were playing with you. Um, I'm curious to know. I want to know the inside scoop of when you get in there. Like, what were the practices like? What was it like in that franchise as compared to, like, maybe some of the other – you don't necessarily have to call out other people. Maybe you had some great franchises. But I'm just curious, the Celtics specifically, because we hear about them all the time as a championship franchise. It's like, how was it ran? How, how were your – how was the organization ran when you were there? Yeah, I think what, what I, I came into and learned there – what the Celtics said from top to bottom, from the, the ticket salespeople to the other people in the front office to the general manager and president of the team then, Red Auerbach, to our coaches, to the players, there was that a great uh, tradition, a great feeling of family. And even even today, you know, they, they take you in as a, as a uh, they take care of the Celtics family uh, and some of the other NBA teams do, the Orlando Magic, I played for later, great for their alumni. But when you're playing there, uh, winning, you know, it's not that you win and then it creates this great environment. I think it's that you create the great environment, the positive environment, and that you win. And, and that you win as you, as you build those, you know, those talented players and right collection of players, you know, the, 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 the parts that fit together. So, um, you know, I went on from the, the Celtics to the LA Clippers, who that time in 88, 89 had one of the worst records in the league. And, had historically been in the talented guys, good guys, excellent coach, but the whole atmosphere of the uh, organization was very different. And, uh, you know, they're at the bottom. So some of that read for itself. So sometimes I found, you know, a little bit in maybe some of the, some of the organizations or teams where you, 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 you might find a little bit less professionalism, I call it from some of the players, but, um, but sometimes that's just because they're young. Sometimes it's because they've been a, you know, a veteran. They've been in other situations and they want out of there. Uh, but that's a, that's a big differentiator. And the Celtics and Ray Arbach, Casey Jones, or coach were excellent about, you know, you, you, you start with Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Robert Paris. That's a pretty good mix. But they had to make the move to get those guys. And then putting the pieces around them was uh, really important. And that's what you still see today with, championship teams like the Celtics or the teams that get to the finals, you know, the Dallas Mavericks made uh, some trades that they wouldn't have been where they're at without PJ Washington and, and, um, and Gafford, Daniel Gafford, who they picked up, you know, with about a third of the season left and uh, changed them from a good playoff team to a champ to a, a finals contender. Totally, man. That's, that's uh, so insightful. I like to hear that stuff, like just the inside scoop, you know, and, you're there with these big name players with the Celtics to start your career. Two championships, I believe, during the time you were there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, talk to me about the championships. What what was it like to be part of an NBA Finals championship twice? Like not not just once, but like what was it? What was it like to actually win? I wonder if you like like I don't even know. Maybe to you it was just like ah, oh, it's just another day at the office. But to me, I'm just like man, that's like the mecca. Like we we did it, you know. And you no, know, that, it yeah, it was it was so cool. It was like, and we're, here it is 40 years later, and we're still talking about it. So I, you know, I get reminded of it often to think about it. Uh, great memories of those uh, and, and great friendships of not the people in the organization, the team. Bill Walton passed, you know, a teammate passed away a few weeks ago. And we had a, a group text exchange with a lot of the former players from that team. And, um, but, you know, going to those, uh, what, what a situation to walk into. The Celtics had won the championship in 81, I, I'm there a rookie, 83, 84, and we go to four straight NBA finals and we win in 84 and 86 against the, the Lakers and the Rockets. That was, you know, the years of the magic bird years. And it was really a turning point for the NBA as far as popularity and TV, uh, you know, exposure and TV contracts. And then of course, so it was bird magic, you know, the tail end of Dr. J and uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's careers. In the in the eighties, but then you get Jordan coming in in the late eight, in the eighties, mid eighties to the nineties, his championship teams, and you see it just exploded. And you see where the you know the popularity of the NBA has gone from from that. And so being a part of that era with those two um, elite, the two most uh, w the winningest franchises, the Celtics and Lakers, the rivalry there it was was very cool and. Uh, Getting to say that you're a champion and, and enjoying that the rest of your life is awesome. 
No, that is, that is so cool. Who was your, like, I guess if you could talk about, I mean, there's probably a ton, but if there was like a teammate that you played alongside with the, the, that Celtics championship organization that taught you the most that you were able to take with you throughout the rest of your playing career, who would it be? And what did they teach you? Well, one of, one of my good friends and, and a college teammate was Danny Ainge. We played together a couple of years at BYU and then he was drafted by the Celtics. Uh, I was, I still had my, I still had two years left at BYU. Then they happened to draft me too. So that was great being there with Danny for uh, four and a half years that I played for the Celtics. And later we played a year, for a year together with the Sacramento Kings. So I think I learned a lot about the ropes and, and the NBA from, from being around Danny. It was great to have him as a teammate during those years. We also had Fred Roberts join us later for a couple of years, another uh, BYU teammate. But, um, I learned a lot from the guys on the bench, the veterans like ML Carr and Scott Wedman, Quinn Buckner, who started out with us. And, and then, um, you know, like I said, we brought on, they brought on Bill Walton in 85, 86. And what an addition, what a unique guy, what a terrific player he was. I had a lot of fun with a guy that I really liked and spent a lot of time with on the court was Ke- and, and off the court. Some was Kevin McHale and Kevin was a master of a lot of, post moves and we spent a lot of time, you know, he, he, I was his, his practice dummy a little bit, but we spent a lot of time playing one-on-one in the post and he let me make a few moves. I learned a lot from him there. And, and so it was uh, great to have Kevin as a teammate. Man, that is, those are some big names, dude. And it's cool that you get to like talk about that. Cause you're one of them. Like you're, you were right there alongside of them. So I, I think that's just incredible. Um, as you, um, as you look at the rest of your career too, I mean, cause that's just the beginning of your career. Like you mentioned, you played, you're one of the, what did you say over like 950 people plus or 952? I don't know exactly what the number was at this moment. What was the exact number of how many players have played? I don't remember. So in the 900s, about 950 that played 10 years. So you're, more. you're one of those, right? And, and so yeah. the, the Celtics were the first half of that, but you had some experience with some other um, organizations. You mentioned the magic earlier and just how they, they treat the alumni, those who have played, you know, within the former players. Um, what was, I guess, your favorite memory outside of the Celtics when, you know, you win a championship? Someone said, man, like, can you even top that? Did you have good experiences that you would be willing to share like that that weren't necessarily a championship, but that you could take with you, life lessons that you were able to take with you throughout the rest of your career? Um, sure. You know, I went on just to run it down after the Celtics. I played for the Clippers for a year and a half, and then the uh, Charlotte Hornets her first year for a couple of months, and then Sacramento Kings for a year. Then I went on to the Orlando Magic for four years. And uh, then my last full year in the NBA was uh, split between the Knicks and the Pacers. So, I mean, I got to be teammates with the guys in the Celtics and and uh, some guys that you recognize, like Mike Woodson, was a, uh, who's the head coach of Indiana, was a teammate with the Clippers. Michael Cage was an NBA rebounder. Sacramento, Kenny Smith was a teammate. Danny Ainge was a teammate. And... Uh, um, with this, with the Magic, I, the first two years they were they were relatively new. It was the second year of the franchise. I got to start uh, most of the games and all, all that experience on those teams that weren't so good, the Kings, Clippers, Hornets. I got to play a lot more. That was really good for me in, in developing as a NBA player, even even though it's more suited to be a backup role. But I did I did start all these most of the games the first two years with just the Magic, and then they they got some guy named Shaq and they gave him my starting job. And, I, and they've never given me an explanation since, you know, I don't know why. Uh, maybe I, w- I was late too much or something. No, Shaq was incredible. You know, he was a unique talent and it was great to be able to uh, play by behind him as a backup center for a couple of years. So, and then went on to play that last year with Reggie Miller as a teammate one uh, part of the year and Patrick Jung as a teammate for the other part of the year. So you talk about, uh, but I, I got to be the flea on the big dog's back in a lot of, situations and and I was blessed with you know some attributes that helped me stick around but also just you know it's it's a little bit of it's a lot of hard work and a little bit of luck because you know there's lots of great players to go and get knocked out a lot sooner by injury so uh and it's a grinding game you know if you play a lot it's gonna wear and tear on you your body you know though that's it's interesting you bring that up because that's that speaks to your ability to keep yourself in check you know um we always talk about it. sometimes it's not the healthy or sorry, it's not the best team that wins it's the healthiest team in football. Same mm-hmm. way. Like sometimes it's just like 
who's healthy when it comes time for the championship. You know, like what? Oh, absolutely. What's going on? Yeah. It's 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 hard to stay healthy, and the fact that you were able to keep your body in check to be able to you're able to sustain that, right? Like you were dependable. Like you could have like that's awesome. That speaks to your work ethic and and the way in which you take care of your body. What do you contribute that to, Greg? Like what what did you? do that like helped you what was your recovery process like uh, to take care of your body while you're playing with some of these big boys like you're, you're you're banging with the big boys there like those are some big names that you're around but you're still able to keep going so obviously there's a reason you're still playing so what did you do to keep you know your body in check um I, well i think it started my career maybe i didn't play as many minutes so that, that, hey, that's that's possible, right? but, but that, that doesn't hurt uh but also um you know, we spent a lot of time staying prepared. Like I was a teammate with Rick Carlisle, the, the Pacers coach on the Celtics, and he and I, some other guys were on the bench. We we put in a lot of awful lot of work just to stay prepared because you know, like I think it was my second year in the league. We had a somebody hurt and somebody sick on the front line, and all of a sudden I'm starting starting in uh, in uh, at Golden State in the next game in Utah at altitude. So and I was able to go out there and perform well. Because in those days, we didn't have a lot. We, we didn't even have a strength and conditioning coach or their training. We kind of just did it on our own. Staying in shape, so, but also off-season. You know, I look at guys, you know, having that professional attitude. And it's something that we talked about that year-round cycle with high school basketball. Sometimes we neglect, see neglecting strength and conditioning, uh, flexibility, all those things. So those are big things for me that I, you know, learned and, and had a background in from our coaches going back to junior high and high school is the, and then certainly in college. So being as fit as you can, you know, makes you more athletic, makes you withstand those injuries. I think a couple of the greatest examples I can think of that, who are the fittest, most in shape guys who worked really hard were Carl, Carl Malone and John Stockton. And you look back at over, you know, 19, 20 year careers. I think they're the two of them, they missed very few games. You know, Carl tore his ligaments in his knee when he played for the Lakers, you know, but yeah, when he's older. <laughs> what happened to me my last you know, second year I'm playing with Shaq, I hadn't had a serious injury to put me out in the, um, in January, I partially tore my Achilles. So it was out the rest of the season. That was most games I'd ever missed. He healed up and was able to play you know, another year, year and a half after that. But um, you know, like I said, it's a little bit of luck, but I think the guys that you find who prepare himself, who don't get, you know, overweight that kind of thing it's just uh it's 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 really important and boy you go to the um most of the college levels now especially division one and at, at um uh, and, and certainly in the nba you have so many resources out there from strength and conditioning coaches to nutritionists to sports psychologists to uh you know exercise and, uh, endurance gurus and, and on and on but you know that's also for younger players at the high school level, I mean, there's a lot of things out there. Just thinking about all the information that's out there, you know, on on videos, YouTube, etc. A lot of things you can learn about the skills, but also learning about how to make your body bigger, stronger, faster, and that's going to help preserve you and help you to perform better. I love that. I think all that's such great insight. I think uh, while there is a, a plethora of information out there, what I've found is that you know the kids that the kids that want to take that and implement it will, but there's still kids that they, you can have all the information you want. If you're not going to do anything with it, you become a professional information gatherer or a pig, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That's what Dre Baldwin once said. And it's a PIG professional information gatherer. You do nothing with it. I would encourage those who are listening to this. If you're a parent, you're an athlete who are listening to Greg, take the advice that he just gave and actually take it seriously. Get that information, learn how to take care of your bodies, because if you're a dependable player sometimes that really matters that could be a difference of you getting a roster spot or not they know that you're going to be there they'll take care of yourself you're not going to be injured all the time that's a big thing if you're available that's huge now greg you talked about the magic during that time it's interesting because some people might not actually fully understand that franchise but during that era like you said that was like when they were brand new and orlando was like you know the town was trying to figure out like it, it, it was it was different it wasn't like it is now it was a new franchise and so um, and then obviously it was like right when Shaq kind of got there and they were trying to do the thing and they're trying to get some hype around it. And Penny was there and all that jazz. But what was it like, I guess, from a player's perspective, I've never had an opportunity to ask somebody this yet. So like being there in Orlando, trying to get the the fans behind it, did you feel like the fans were 
pretty awesome or was it kind of a struggle to try to get the community behind the the team no it was it was great there there was a big buzz it was the biggest thing in town i mean it was one pro sports team town university of central florida ucf that's there and then you know and at, at that time in the early 90s there were growing athletic program but not as uh prominent as they are now so no the magic were it. it's kind of a it's a city a lot like salt lake is or portland or sacramento um they they uh the basketball franchises there have kind of been you know number one and they were you know with the shack era you know the, the fans were in love with them and their exciting crowds went even when we were uh, those first three years when we weren't a playoff team but then shack came uh we tied for the last playoff spot but uh but it didn't go to class because of the tiebreaker. And then the next year we go in the playoffs, we had Penny. And then the, the following year I was gone uh, by that time uh, on to uh, other pastures, but they, they made the NBA finals, which is really, and you talk about a buzz. I mean, that, you know, they lost to the Rockets in the finals in uh, what would that have been like 95, I think. Uh, I was playing for the Pacers actually then. We lost to the, the Magic in the Eastern Conference finals at the end of that year. But uh, that was a meteoric rise. You know, most teams that, that get to the finals or, or contend for the finals kind of climb the ladder traditionally. It's not because – but they had two unique – you had some good players, and then you put in two unique talents like Shaq and Penny, and boom, they were there. So there was buzz in Orlando. They got it back a little bit during the Dwight Howard years where they went to the finals. And then they kind of had 10 mediocre years now. Now they got some good young talent, and the excitement's coming back. So – but it's a, it's a good uh, – Orlando, Orlando Magic are, 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 are big in, in the town, just like you see it in, you know, Sacramento is a great place. Even with losing teams, they're always there supporting their their team and their great fans. And that's so cool. I, as a kid, when I was when I was younger, I was born in 88, but, like, I was, like, five, six years old during that era. So it's kind of cool to, like, talk to somebody who was there in that time. And I just remember the jerseys were the coolest jerseys, dude. I was like, I'm a jazz fan, die hard, right? Like John Stockton, Carl Malone, Jeff Warren, like that whole era. Love the jazz, hate the bulls. I'm not a Michael Jordan guy. He pushed off. I will still stick to that for the rest of my life, but I love the magic's jerseys. So it's just like, I was always like hyped about their colors and their jerseys. And so I've always kind of stuck with that, even though I'm 35 now still love it. So that's, mm -hmm. that's really cool. Um, you know, one thing that was on my mind that I wanted to ask before, you know, this interview was done was regarding contracts and the differences between contracts then and now, you know, one thing that I always talk about, Greg, maybe you can give some insight to this when I'm talking to people about like, who's the greatest of all time. And they talk, you know, Michael, LeBron, whomever else. Right. I try to explain to them the difference in contracts and how that might make a change and like how a team is built like the bulls different situation. I mean, con the, it wasn't a five year max deal back then like you could i think Shaq had a seven if i'm not mistaken something like that it was like a seven-year deal like you could sign players chris weber from my my understanding had like a 15-year contract as a rookie or something when he got drafted it was a weird situation like it was just different i felt like the bulls were able to structure their team the way they did because they just sign a guy for 10 years like scotty pippen and just like keep him on contract and like can't do that now you have to like renegotiate every four or five years and it's just kind of weird but i'm curious your your thoughts on that on on the the contract differences back then with this, I don't know what if the CBA even existed or if it's just different negotiations compared to what it, what it is now. Yeah. So the CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, that's what determines all this, the length of the contracts and the, and the salary cap amount and all the benefits to players. It also is where the, the uh, rookie draft uh, rookie salary scale has come from. So you've got the, when you get into the, the collective bargaining agreement, just like, other things where you've got a union and management it's the nbpa negotiating with the, uh, the nba and their owners and that usually comes up every about every four to six years and um so uh yeah there was a time until the um uh, probably the early 2000s when there were unlimited uh, years on a contract but you typically saw a lot of four you know three to four year contracts i had two three-year contracts, my first two contracts in the NBA. I was a 21st pick in the NBA draft. But um, now they do limit for the veterans. I'm not sure if it's five. And like the rookies, they have a, the first-round picks of the rookies, I think it's three years with an option for the fourth. So, um, and so that's part of the give and take in bargaining. They want to they want to talk, you know, they want to be able to, the owners want to be able to make it make sense for them financially, but the players want to be able to, 
know, get the most free agency and money, but also, you know, protection for years. You know, like one thing that people always talk about is one and done. They go, well, why doesn't the NCAA or the NBA change that? The, the, the one year rule is because it's in collective bargaining. So for, for year, you know, there was for years, like going back to Moses Malone, Daryl Dawkins, Kevin Garnett, LeBron, you could come straight out of high school and play in the NBA. The NBA would have loved to have kept before they had the G League. College basketball was a great, you know, feeder system for them. So they, they wanted guys to be able to stay in school three or four years. So they, the mutual and where the players want them to be, be able to be eligible to be drafted right out of high school. So the happy medium that they met in bargaining was one year. And it's, it's stuck like that one year or 19 years old if you're coming from overseas. So that's why that is an example of what it is. But, you know, the most amazing thing, and people talk about these salaries, and, and I mentioned the Magic Bird years where the TV viewers and, and really took off. And you had David Stern, you had the Dream Team, you had Jordan, and it became a worldwide game. Is that you basically have, you think about the vision, you have a numerator and denominator. So the denominator is the number of players, okay? That's that's about 15. Now it's it's always been between about 12 and 15 players that you're paying. All that's how we do. But the numerator, that's the number from the collective bargaining agreement that's dedicated towards salaries and benefits. And that's always been around about 50%, give or take. So you went from the NBA, you know, what are they? The TV deal now is going to be like, I don't know how many billions. So, oh, yeah. it's a, yeah. the, Especially the one coming up. Like they just discussed that just recently. Yeah. It's a massive deal. Oh, yeah. They're talking about that there will be a player who makes $100 million in, in, within the next five to six years, probably with the new TV deal. But, and so it's just because there's been so much money into the system and the value of the franchises. You know, when I was a rookie, um, the uh, minimum salary was $40,000. Wow. And the rest of my career, only the highest I got to was about 120. Now the minimum's over a million. And and the rookie, there wasn't a rookie salary cap, but they kind of slotted you. So I was 21st pick, you know, slotted you based on what did the guy ahead of you get? You know, what did the guy below you get? And what did the big 21st pick get last year? So I got a, my contract was 100,000, 125, 150. And only the first year of the 100 was guaranteed. Now the 21st pick in this year's NBA draft next week will you know, get about $9 million guaranteed. I think it is eight to nine with a little, and there's a little bit of negotiation room above that amount. And the first pick will get over 32 to 33 million. So it's, oh, man. You know, the, average, the average salary is like, you know, I don't know, five, six, seven million when you average them all out. But um, and you got the, the, the max contract guys getting, what, 40, 50 million a year now. So it's it's an amazing uh, money machine. And there's there's some obviously great for a lot. There's, there's a little bit of downside in that sometimes, too, but it works its way out. And just, uh, you know, what a what a great place to be if you <laughs> didn't get there as far as it. Financial, but you know, I, I think still it goes down to that. You guys are real pros and really care about it. I mean, the money's great, and sure, these guys can be set up for life and even multiple generations. But the but the champions and or the guys who contend for championships, it's all about you know, it's because of the competitions being the best player. They don't get those contracts without not only being talented, but, but having that professionalism and that work ethic to get there. For sure, for sure, man. Like. And that's is wild to me. And I can just imagine, I mean, like if I, I wasn't at that level, but I'm like, man, if I were looking at this, I'm like, dude, I could have, if I was playing these days. I'd be making X amount of dollars. Are you freaking kidding me? Like, but it is cool to see that you guys were kind of the, the start of that in regards to TV deals and all that stuff. Like you were talking yeah. about that era. So you're pioneers yeah. of the game in that regard, right? Yeah. And, 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 and uh, it's very interesting thing is, you know, what, look what's happening with colleges and NIL and then, even now, there's Florida just passed it. There's 31 states that high school kids can earn yeah. NIL money. So there's, there's, uh, you know, some of the Division One teams. There's role players <laughs> in it with NIL and basketball making uh, six, seven hundred thousand more money than they'll ever make in their in one year in their life. I mean, you know, usually a role player even from a Division One team, he's at, at, you know, maybe playing some pro basketball, but not likely a, an NBA guy or an NBA fringe guy. So. It's a pretty incredible. It's a, it's a very backwards thing, you know, to most people in life. I mean, what most people in their lives won't make this kind of money in any one year, but but it's backwards in that most of the time we earn more money as we get older. You yeah. know, in our forties, fifties, and sixties, we got a little more experience, and, and we and we 
suffered and strived in, in, in sports. It's very backwards. Like I said, there's, you know, pro basketball and probably pro football and others, you know, playing five years is a long time. And then you're done, oh, yeah. you know, or 10 or like we talked about 15, very few. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a, a challenge for sometimes to have all that money and take care of it. Right. And, and set yourself up for the rest of your life. So. Totally. You know, it's uh, funny. I, I was, you know, at a basketball tournament in December or January this year, local tournament. They had guys coming in from different high schools in California, Arizona, Nevada, into Idaho. And we had a tournament that we were watching here. It was super, super cool. And uh, one of the kids uh, is going to play division one ball next year and he'll be in the NBA the following year. And so he's, he was a senior this year and he had, you know, seven figures in his bank account. That was kind of the deal. Cause he got an NIL deal. And I'm like, dude, this kid's 17 years old, seven yeah. figures. And I mean, I was just watching him play and the way he conducted himself. He's actually super respectful. One of the most respectful height. I mean, he's almost seven feet tall, super athletic, but he was super respectful to everybody. I was just like, I, he, he was really good. His impression for me, was really awesome. And Bob was just sitting there thinking, man, like what a day to be alive, huh? If you're a good athlete, yeah. like, kids well, already yeah. doing big things at, at the age of 17, 18 years old. And he's going to do even more. I hope so long yeah. as he's healthy. You know, it's cool to see. I mean, some of the, uh, the non-revenue sports, the Olympic sports, there's gymnasts and and uh, other athletes because they've developed a following. The amazing thing with social media, they've built these followings, and and uh, that's part of one reason they're able to command it, that or, or get that type of money. You know, even as a what used to be an amateur, <laughs> and now so it's it's changing. But you know, people got young 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 players got to keep in mind, young athletes got to keep in mind, and parents. That's not going to happen for everybody. And there's still going to be, I think when we get into the next few years, we're going to see maybe some kind of split up of the major schools and the smaller schools. And hopefully it won't, you know, what's going on with pay won't kill the Olympic sports and colleges, but they may be separated off. Or, you know, I think we might see, you know, basketball and football at the 60 or so biggest schools in a separate organization from the rest of the sports and, and the smaller schools. So that's why, I think it's always important, you know, you got you to gotta play and do it for the love of the game. And if those things work out, you know, they do, because all the, all the benefits of, of playing sports and being involved in sports, uh, they're, they're much more lasting than, than, you know, any financial benefit. And uh, just the friendships and memories, camaraderie. And look at you, for example, I mean, there's a, there's a, it's a trillion dollars. If you love sports, it's going to end where you play sometime, but it's a, trillion dollar industry there's all kinds of things from being a podcaster to a broadcaster to a coach to a, an athletic trainer to being in marketing so it's a cool thing you know you can you can love the game and and set your sights if that's what you want to stay involved in with with being in something that you can do for the rest of your life in the game or or for much of your life for sure man i love that what's cool about this greg just t chatting with you there's there's a lot of people i've talked to that have differing opinions on the state of athletics right now, just because of the money that's involved. They have a different opinion on it. I love that your perspective, it's, it's semi-positive, right? Like you're, you're, you, see, you see the positives, you see the negatives to it, but like from this conversation, you have a really positive outlook for like what it can be. And that right there was cool. It's like the opportunities, you see the opportunities that are endless. So my last question for you, Greg, as we wrap it up, man, is just, you, you mentioned it, you alluded to it, friendships, camaraderie, you know, you've, the network you've built, all this stuff, like throughout your professional career though, just, and even now, like just your involvement in athletics, what is the biggest life lesson that basketball, even up till now you're involved in it still has taught you the biggest life lesson from a player to now, whatever, what is the biggest life lesson that basketball has taught you? Hmm. Boy, you're making me think here. I, I, uh, there's a lot of them, but, uh, I think what's important that, that I've learned is is uh, persistence, hard work, coupled with having fun. You know, you gotta it's gotta be you gotta have some joy in it, and some of that joy comes from that persistence, that dedication, and hard work. That the the grind, as they call it now, to get there. It's a journey. It's not necessarily. Uh, what you get there, not 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 the end. The end is fun when you can win a championship, but the end can also be sad when you lose or or your playing days are over. It's kind of like here's this void. But that journey, that being able to be part of a team, being able to compete, have your body, you know, work hard and sweat and ache and 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 run and jump is is uh, 
it, 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 it brought a lot of joy to me. It still does. You, you miss it. And so I think that's, that wasn't one thing I said. I'm sorry, but it's that I think that's what uh, what I loved about it and love about it. I love and love about other sports and watching other people compete and, and and understand a little bit of what they go through to get get where they're at. That's so cool, man. The journey, the journey. That's what it is. I, I love hearing it, man. From someone who's been there, you know it. The journey is that's the best part. Like all the ups and downs, everything in between. It's not just the destination. It's everything you learn on the, throughout the whole entire process. I think that's so cool. Greg, I appreciate you like being willing to join me, man. You got a crazy busy schedule. You're flying all over the place. You're visiting family and all the things that you're doing. But thank you for joining me. I hope to be able to stay in touch with you in the future, man. It's like, this is super cool for me. And I hope you understand. Like, I know you've probably done this stuff a million times, but I'm like 35 years old and I'm still like a fanboy of the game. And so for me, it's still really cool. I try to keep a professional side here on the podcast, but I'm also a fan. So from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you for, for joining the podcast. You're, you're welcome. You're doing an awesome job and and, and good luck to you. It's uh, you, you've, you've established yourself and I know you'll keep going and, and be a great joy to many uh, fans and listeners. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you. And for all those who are listening, make sure to hit that subscribe button because we'll be coming to you next week with another interview. Take care. Guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of my show. Now, if you could go and do me a favor, head over to iTunes, give me five stars and leave me a review. It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your support.